Good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you are. I think it's all still afternoons everywhere. Maybe uh, Queensland is 5 p.m. right now. Western Australia, we're just on 3 and Northern Territory, 4.30 p.m. Welcome, my name's Dante. I'll be taking you through today's blog and syndication webinar. Um, it's going to be a fast and furious one and I'm actually going to write a blog while we're here and um, I'm going to ask for a little bit of uh, participation from everybody so I can get an idea of exactly what I'm going to write that blog on a little bit later. So I was going to test my skills to see if I can write a blog about a business I don't know and probably an industry I don't know anything about. But that's part of this course. It's to help you to find ways to do the research and find the tools that are going to make it a lot easier for you to do this. So today's topic is blog syndicate and dance brought to you by Business Station's Australian Small Business Advisory Services Digital Solutions Program. Thanks to the Australian government for that one in association in Brisbane and Queensland with Regional Development Australia and in the Northern Territory Treaty Business Consulting. I'm going to start off with a quick quote and it's from Sylvia Plath, a very, very famous author saying that everything in life is writable about if you have the outgoing guts to do it and the imagination to improvise. The worst enemy to creativity is self-doubt. Um, just had a question, Diane saying, are we recording this? Absolutely. This will be part of our Business Station's YouTube channel in about 48 hours. It takes about two days and they can get that going once they um, edit out all my messes. So yes, please just uh, pop in there um, to youtube.com and then search for Business Station and you'll see that there's a whole series of C19 Biz Booster webinars in there. In a couple of days, you'll also see this one as well and all the other ones I've done. I've done quite a few now. So who is this for today? We're looking at the busy. This particular method is a really fast way of starting to do it. The overthinker is you already know if you are one, if you're an overthinker. So you find that you can't really get going with blogging because you tend to overthink it all the time. We're going to look at the beginner where you're not even sure what the word blog means. Just as an idea, it's, um, it's short for weblog, which in the old days of blogging was an idea that you were, it's like a diary, an online diary. And so that got shortened by internet elite speak by making it into blog as something short. It's a very unfortunate sounding name though. Wish we could rename it somehow. Can't we just call it articles or something? What we're going to cover this afternoon is what blogging is and why you should bother with it. That's pretty basic stuff. But for those of you who are just starting out, that could be a great thing. We look at some of the myths, the SEO stuff, and the great lie of the tortured writer and part of the process of me writing a blog on something I do not know this afternoon is to show you that it doesn't take a great writer. Um, it doesn't take a tortured creative genius to come up with something like this. And we're also going to syndicate your blog to other places where you can send your blog to get a little bit more bang for your buck than just your WordPress website or whatever WordPress kind of clone you're using, whether it's Joomla or you know, Wix, Squarespace, Oncord, any of those kind of platforms. My name's Dante, as I said a little bit earlier. I work with Google's Digital Springboard Project as a trainer. Um, that helps us to get a lot of word out about digital literacy to businesses particularly, and to those who are looking to upskill their basic digital skills. I also work with the Boost with Facebook campaign uh, program, which is um, as a Facebook community trainer. I travel quite a lot around Australia doing stuff with that. And we've got tons of free webinars about to come up in August too. Um, I've got my credentials from the Chartered Institute of Marketing in the UK. I did that remotely. I didn't go to the UK. I would love to, to have gone to the UK and I could say I've done it, but I've never actually been there, but I've got a uh, connection through them there. The U University of New South Wales Business School gave me my Bachelor and Masters of Business Information Systems. I'm a certified practicing marketer with the Australian Marketing Institute. I I currently do a lot of uh, lecturing through Maclay College in Sydney as well, um, remotely again. I'm actually based in Darwin, not in Sydney. And I provide content for startups.com, which is like a bit of a, um, a, an open college for founders of new startups. It's probably a good one, actually, if you want to try and get that. I believe they did have a free offer to get a whole bunch of stuff from that from my favorite little place called AppSumo. So you can probably uh, get access to some of their material for free in there. So let's see, we've got um, showing your expertise is one of the first things you want to do when it comes to writing a blog. It's an idea for you to share what you know about, to look at the stuff that you know about, the things that you have some degree of, sorry, there's like a, a, a dust devil at my window that looks like it's about to hit my window. So I'm a little bit distracted. 
It's like a little mini tornado, crazy. Okay, so what you're doing is showing your expertise about the things you know and love. So it doesn't have to be what you do for work necessarily. It could also be about the things you do as a hobby. Say for instance, if you like working on cars, but you never made a cent from it, well, that could be a great way of going about it. It also works to attract searches in Google. This really probably is the primary reason why people, particularly businesses like yourselves, are going to be looking to write a blog. It's to attract more search results in Google. And it certainly does that. And even though, you know, a whole bunch of people who will say, oh no, get on social media, do social media. I work for a social media company. I know how powerful and important social media is. But if you were to sit there and write a new blog post every day for three months, you will move the needle in Google. You will change your position on Google dramatically. And I, I, I know that because I did that. I wanted to attach certain things I wanted to do. I wanted to attract certain search as searches going to my website from Google. And to do that, I literally sat there for three months and wrote a blog post every day for three months using this particular format we're going to cover today to move that needle, to jump me up some positions. And I got into number ones and number twos and number fives and in places where I wasn't even ranking at all. So that sort of stuff, it does move the needle. You just got to be willing to be fairly persistent with it. And we're going to look at repurposing and syndicating it as all. Well. We're not just going to stop at this blog. You don't just write a blog and that's it. You can turn in the graphics and video for social media. You can publish a blog elsewhere. There's a few names that are in this one here who actually were in one of my previous uh, webinars where I showed you how to turn one single blog into over 30 pieces of content for social media, for websites, for LinkedIn, for all kinds of places. We could use that on YouTube. You could use it on Facebook, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Instagram, all these different places. This is looking less at creating those social media pieces and more at getting the most that you possibly can out of a blog, particularly when it comes to the ability to syndicate it into other places. And we'll address some of the issues around that shortly too. Now the process of blogging is generally that you choose a topic. That's pretty much you know, a given. You choose your topic you wanna to write on, then you write the blog using a fairly simple formula because if you're gonna do this regularly, it has to be simple, right? You can't just make this a, a creative nightmare every time you wanna do something. Then you publish and syndicate. You publish it first to your website if that's the place that is most useful to you, and then you publish it elsewhere, which brings up a lot of um, questions when it comes to SEO, but it's okay. We're not going to necessarily look at those questions. We're going to look at first the magic blogging formula. And there's nothing magic about it. I'm not one of those gurus that says, follow my tricks, follow my magic hints, nothing magic. This is basically the same as writing an essay back when you were at school. You basically propose a question or ask a question. In this case, something common that people ask you about. So if you're a web developer, then what are the things that your clients often ask you about? If you're a graphic designer, what do your clients ask you about? If you're a personal trainer, what are the things that people ask you about? Then you directly answer that question. Once upon a time, we didn't do that. We'd ramble on for three and a half pages of, of waffle until we actually got to the answer. These days, Google does not reward you for writing 16,000 words on every topic. They're looking for quick answers, quick, authoritative, credible answers from authoritative, credible places. So if you are in your market, the authority and the credibility for answering questions on scented oils or on um, network marketing, then you should be answering those questions as directly as you can in the first paragraph at least, but in the first sentence, if you possibly can. You know, when you say, hey, G or hey, Siri or, um, you know, hello, Alexa and all those different voice things. Now, when you come up as an answer for those, it's usually a question that you ask and one answer that's given back, not a list of answers, not a page full of results, it's one answer. So the ultimate for you as voice becomes an increasingly important part of search is to make sure that your answer is really concise and fits exactly the question that's being asked. Then in a blog, we don't just ask the question and answer it. We didn't have to explain it. We have to flesh it out a little bit. Now we're not going to go, like I said, into some academic, um, academic deconstructed um, thesis. We're going to go into really, really simple process of using examples or expanding upon the points you've answered 
So you don't just go, here's the question, here's the answer. You show a little bit of authority. You show a bit of knowledge to make that person who's reading able to think, I can trust where this is coming from. Now, this is may seem like a for, like a really simple formula for you. Ask a question, answer the question, explain it out. Um, but when you get it underway, it kind of is. Now, I'm going to write a blog now. This is going to be pretty scary for me. So I'm going to need a volunteer. I need somebody to type in the name of their business into the Zoom webinar chat. And the first person in there is a the person I'm going to write this about. And Ballard Industrial. Okay, so Lauren from, all, uh, from Ballard Industrial, you do molasses pumps. You're gonna to have to tell me what a molasses pump is a little bit. Just give me one line on what a molasses pump is and that will um, tell me a little bit about what I'm going to write about. So I'm gonna pull this out. Come on, get out of full screen. You can do it. There we go, buddy. You know, look at all my dead files. Now I'm going to pull up a screen where I can start searching. You can see me start to write a blog any moment now. So it's a pump for molasses for feeding livestock. Gotcha. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look for molasses pump. Now, as I'm typing out molasses pump, notice how it automatically pre-fills a bunch of stuff. So it's going molasses pumps for sale, molasses pumps, Australia, molasses pump. Yeah. We're not actually making this, this is for livestock. So a livestock. So I'm going to look for molasses pumps Australia as an idea of what I'm looking for. I'm going to open up my um, little Google Docs. Let me just open that up properly. Docs. And so I'm going to jot these things off as I'm going. So I use Google Docs only because it's um, nice and easy to, to save it somewhere. So molasses pumps um, blog. If I can only type, this is gonna be my challenge today. Typing and looking up at this screen instead of down the one I normally look at. Okay, second thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go and look for what I can find. So this looks like the right kind of stuff. They're molasses pumps. Um, we can look at what people are doing with them. We can say, okay, there's, generally these people are selling molasses pumps. And I'm guessing you probably do the same thing, but these, um, there you go, Ballard Industrial, you're right there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out this, your website address. I'm going to go to a thing called the keyword planner in Google ads. So I need to go to Google ads platform to begin with. So I don't just get it right. There we go. So if you don't have uh, Google's ads platform yet, it's worth setting it up. Not just not to necessarily start the process of advertising, but to use one of its best tools, which is a thing called the keyword planner. I'm going to use this keyword planner to allow me to, so I'm just switching my accounts to log into the right place. No, I just logged into the wrong one. It's okay. Back here. My apologies. This should have been all preset on a different um, browser. Let's bring up the correct one. All right, ads.google.com. I accidentally shut down my other browser window, so I need to start again. Uh, here we go. So I'm in here. So I'm in um, the Google Ads platform. So this is currently running nothing live at the moment. I go to Tools and Settings in Google Ads. I'm going to this thing called the Keyword Planner. What it's going to let me do is to search for things that are relevant to what I want to see. So I want to see either, you know, the forecast for what I think people are searching for, or I want to discover new keywords. This is a tricky way of me going, I want to discover what people are searching for when they search for molasses pumps within Australia. So I can start with either keywords like molasses pumps, or I can start with a website like yours. So Lauren, you've got ballardindustrial.com.au. I'm going to use your site and it's going to go into Google, strip your site and go, what is this site about? And then pull out what it believes that your site's about. So I'm going in here going, okay, it's not really finding much. So that's <laughs> just, which is sad. I've got it set for Australia. It's searching the Google network. I want to look at it probably over, you know, every bit of data that's possibly available. So it's telling me that's not quite enough data for them to pull enough out to make it meaningful. 
So let's pull out some of the people who are some of the leaders that may be in your area. So if I look for just say, um, who, well, who was number one here? Number one was all pumps. So I'm just going to grab them. Look at that page only. Sorry if I'm rushing through this. This is the reason why we do, um, why we do um, record these. And it's going to pull the information from this page. So when it's pulled at all, it's going to tell me a bunch of ideas for what people are searching for when they come across this page for these guys. So it's telling me, you know, all the search volumes over the years, which is great across Australia, lots of searches over 120,000. At some points it goes over, you know, quite a lot higher. So, you know, 111,470 searches in January this year. My last pumps were very popular. They peaked a five year peak in January this year. So we know that people are searching for this. Now down here, I start to see what are the things that people are searching for? What are they typing into Google to find this result? Now, a water pump, not really what we're looking for. I don't know what a peristaltic pump is. So I'm gonna look for maybe based on the most amount of searches, you know, order in what is searched for the most. Water pumps, pumps, Davy pumps, submersible pumps. So it's searching a lot of stuff on their site that looks like it's very, very, not particularly, um, particularly relevant to what we're looking for. I don't think your average water pump is gonna pump a lot of molasses through it. Molasses is thick and sticky. So we're gonna go back and look for more ideas. We're gonna go, okay, if it's not gonna find it in there, let's not search for a site. Let's start with keywords. Let's search for molasses pump. Sales and service. Let's try that. So across Australia, there's not really a lot of searches for that. Let's just look for molasses pump. So as we get closer and closer to what we're looking for, now we're starting to get a bit closer. So monthly, we can see that the highest search results are for the word molasses pump, molasses pumps for sale, molasses transfer pump, molasses transfer gear pump, types of molasses pumps. So 10 people roughly per month on average are searching for that. But 40 per month in Australia are searching for molasses pump. So I'm going to pick up one of these and go types of molasses pumps. And that's going to form what my blog entry is going to be. So I'm going to call it types of molasses pumps. Now, I don't know what molasses pumps do. I don't really understand what they are. So I'm going to put in what is a molasses pump. So it's going, okay, pump types for molasses. So let's go all pumps are pretty much these guys. Uh, the Google authority in Australia for molasses pumps, even though they may not be, they may not be all that good or they might be great. What they're telling us is there's a bumps, there's a bump, bunch of types of pumps for molasses. So we're not going to copy and paste what they're doing. We're just going to say, yep, the, t the type of gear you need is a gear pump. So we go, okay, we know that. So the question that we're going to ask is what type of pump I'll try and make this a bit bigger for you so you can actually read it. So 24 is used for pumping molasses for stock feed. So what I've got to do straight away is according to our, our, our little, um, our formula is I've got to answer that straight away. So my answer is going to be, I'll make it slightly smaller so you can see it. We know that from there, you need a gear pump. So a gear pump is the correct kind of pump for pumping oh, molasses. I'm really out of my depth here today. I had to pick this one, didn't I? Less molasses for stock feed. So what I'm trying to do here is establish the question and put it in Australia. So I'm mentioning that this is Australia. So it immediately says this is an answer that's verifiable for Australia. I've said what the answer is. It's a gear pump is a correct kind of pump for pumping molasses for stock feed in Australia. Um, I can then credit the place where I got it from. So I can say, I don't know, these guys are, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the authority in your market or whether they're even competitors, but I can then credit them back. So I can say, according to these guys, that um, they're a type of rotary positive displacement pump. 
So they are a type of rotary type displacement pump according to the team at allpumps.com.au. So I've answered that now. Now what I want to do, I want to expand it out a bit. Now bear in mind, these guys have the number one results on Google in Australia for, for types of molasses pumps. This is all written to get that result. So you can imagine you don't have to write a great big scientific article to get a result that works. So a blog doesn't just become a long, long read. It becomes something that answers the question you need. So we're going to go, okay, so to back up what we just said, gear pumps transfer fluid by gears coming in and out of mesh to create a non-pulsating pumping action. So we can go the non-pulsating <laughs> pumping action in a gear pump used for pumping molasses is useful for, now I'm going to get a bit more information on that. Four, 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 four. High pressures and high viscosity fluids. So I'm going to say it's useful for pumping, is useful for, um, for thick fluids used in stock feeds. And I can say that um, this, also, this is also a very, a very heavy duty type of pump. After all, if it's pumping something like molasses, it has to be. So that's point number one. So if I've got my first statement answering the question, I'm going to go point number one. I want another two points. So I'm going to drag those points out of some other areas where I might find it. So let's go molasses pump. And let's see. So I think you said the skin text one or sent the sign text or syntax one is really good. So we can pull out a bit of information about this particular kind of pump. So if this is a pump kit where it's specifically designed to pump thick and heavy solutions such as molasses and honey. It comes with either a petrol drive or electric motor drive. So that's a little bit of information that we can add in that, that molasses pump kits like those from uh, science, Syntex or Scientex um, are offered with either a petrol engine. So we can actually show a little bit of authority there. Um, whether you are used to running your rural equipment on petrol or electrical power. Many pump manufacturers like Syntex offer either electrical or fuel-based pumps. You may have a preference for one or the other, or you may require the specific functions of one or the other. So I've made my second point. Third, so I'm showing that I know a little bit about the market. I'm showing that I know what the technology is. So what else can I find out about molasses pumps here? So we go, okay, so Scientex are really good. I'm probably, you know, probably making you hate the way I'm pronouncing that, uh, Lauren. I'm sorry about that. So if we look for something else, so, so electric motor driven, molasses gear pump outfit, you got Bella, let's see what yours actually says. So you can so pumps and kits are available. So that's actually really useful because that tells me that you don't just buy a pump, but you can buy kits that go with it as well. So I'm going to mention something a little bit about that. Now, if you already have a pump, you may just require a kit to turn it into, now I'm probably getting this wrong, a molasses pump. But most suppliers give you the option of purchasing the whole pump 
or just the parts you need to upgrade your existing equipment. Molasses pumps are used almost universally across Australia when it comes to um, delivering high nutrient stock feed. As such, they are widely available to agricultural um, buyers. Now, that is the basic bones of a blog. Now, I knew nothing about molasses pumps. I didn't even know that stock were fed molasses as a feed. Um, that's what my grandmother used to put into her cooking. So <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's, it's something that's very, very new to me. But in amongst all that, that is a fairly readable and, a, and an informative little article about it. And I wrote that in about, what, 10 or 12 minutes? And I don't know anything. I'm not even a talented writer. All I did was just pull apart a particular way of describing the way that we're going to do this. So the way that we're going to be able to write, it's a formula. Now let me pull up the correct version of my window here, this one here. There we go, nearly there. So it's just a formula. It's not that you need to be a good writer. It's not that you necessarily need to be very talented or a wordsmith. I'm certainly have my moments where I can be those things, but I'm not necessarily a wordsmith, particularly on things I don't know anything about. But that can show you how quickly you can with that magic formula. We asked a question, we answered it in that first section, and then we explain that idea based upon some information we could make. Now, Lauren's saying I did exceptionally well. That's good. So I honestly was so out of my depth. I'm a city boy, so I did not know anything about this stuff. The same could go for whatever you're selling. So if you're a web designer, this is something that you could pull out and go, what are the questions that people ask? And I could throw 10 ideas about what people ask web designers straight away because I do some of that myself. But say, say that you are a, um, a physical therapist. So you do something like, let's just say physiotherapy. So the kind of people, the things that people would ask is, what is the deal with ultrasound and why do physiotherapists use it? Or it could be, what are some of the techniques that you guys use? What do physiotherapists think about chiropractic? What do physiotherapists do with knee injuries? Is there an approach for a physiotherapist to say why they would um, choose to not use massage therapy, but to use ultrasound? What is the difference between a massage therapist and a physiotherapist? Now, these are all questions. That was like seven straight up maybe six, six straight up. So there's an idea that you can just ask the questions that people already ask you or ask a bunch that you can think of yourself. It's just like a, a way of saying, yes, I want to um, ask a, f a frequently asked questions. And that's kind of the new approach to the blog these days. A blog used to have a recommended, you know, length of words. Originally it was about 300 words. Then it became 500 words. The next one we turned around, it had 1600 words, then 3000 words. Then it became, okay, you've got to have multiple pages and present it like an academic. It became out of control. Like you and I, we own businesses. We don't have time for that stuff. We're not going to sit there and write stuff. So what happened was a lot of that stuff got pushed out to people who write blogs for a living. And then as that got too expensive, then they started pushing it out to people overseas who wrote a lot of stuff, which is just rambling about basically everything I just wrote about molasses stock feed and about molasses pumps was pretty much an inability for the, it could have been said in those short amount of words, but the old formula of writing blogs would stretch that out and waffle on about it for ages and ages and ages. But as we saw the number one result the molasses pumps in Australia that I could see was someone who wrote even less words than we did. So this is going to depend heavily upon what your competition is and what the words are that you want to weave into it. Now, yes, you could be a web designer or a graphic, let's say a, gra a graphic designer, you're a graphic designer and there's about 30,000 others of them of you 
in the state of Queensland. So how do you stand out with that? Well, the first thing you can do is you start to localize yourself. So you don't just ask questions such as, um, what do, uh, what's, what's, the best pro, what's the best platform to build a website on? You go, what's the best platform to build a website on for a Queenslander or for someone in Perth? You localize down the questions and the answers that immediately tells Google that this is something that's being written specifically for that market. If you're in Alice Springs, same thing goes. What is, what is the best way to um, achieve a good graphic design or a good logo for a business in Alice Springs? So you actually type that as your question. That's your title of your blog. Then you answer that question straight away as soon as you can. Because Territorians strongly associate themselves with the color ochre, it's recommended that you have some reference to the color ochre in what you're doing, unless you feel like that won't stand out in your market, then use darker colors like black to offset it. So that could be the answer. And then you go around and say, why Territorians like ochre? why you need to offset it with other colors, why there's some examples of people, other people who use it so you know what to avoid or what to emulate. And then you can explain your answer uh, in those three main points. So as far as recommended number of words for a blog, it seems to change every year and it depends on which guru you listen to. But what I've noticed is that the length of the blog bears absolutely no relevance to the amount of search, requ search requests you get unless you're looking for a global audience. So that's people like who are writing on SEO, for instance, need to write very long, very involved things, and they need to generate a lot of traffic through their blog. So you've got guys like Neil Patel, um, you got, oh gosh, I can't even remember half the blogs now, but they're, you know, a lot of those guru type people that they're not just doing a blog, but they're also doing a lot of social media. They're doing a lot of podcasting and video to back that up as well. So most of you are going to be competing with your local market or at least with an Australian market. So the, the desire to be really competitive can be done without having to write super, super long blogs. So we've written our blog. Now we wanna start looking at what syndication is. And syndication is a funny little fella because it's where, it's where you're essentially taking that same blog and you're copying and pasting it to somewhere else. You're going to other sites, you're going onto social media, you're going to other blogging platforms. Some of them might be really familiar to them. Some of them might be a first time. We'll look at some of those as well. It's then doing something like maybe turning it into a podcast. So most of the time when I write a blog, I write it in a very casual voice so that I can then take that and record it and use it into a podcast because Google is now reading and indexing the contents of podcasts. So that's really starting to change the game. Because if you've got something which is words on a page, then you've got those words in a, an audio format that's being indexed as well. It's giving you two major places that are starting to fill, that's starting to produce you as an authority or as some kind of credible person in that area. But then also, you know, there's not just podcasting, there's video. Now, I'm, not the first, I'm just generally not a video guy. I know I'm on a video here. I'm not really the kind of guy who likes to talk to my phone and tell people about how wonderful and wise I am and why they should spend money with me. It just doesn't sit right with me and I'm getting better at it as I try to do a bit more of that. But be honest, it's not me. But if video is something that is important to you, you're probably on the right track because Google are also getting the words you're saying in a video and they're transcribing it in their servers and indexing that stuff. And if you look for anything that's so a how to, how to fix a molasses pump, how to choose the right physiotherapist, how to choose a web designer in your local area, what you'll find is not only are you getting results that are text on a page, but you're also getting video responses from YouTube and other various places like Vimeo and Daily Motion. And you're getting responses in the terms of uh, podcasts as well. So you're not just getting the stuff that's written, you're getting the video and you're getting the audio as well. So it's really important now to try and repurpose what you're writing into something a bit more. Um, now, a few weeks ago, I did do like this excellent, awesome, it was so much fun because people got so much out of it, of a, a webinar which was showing you how to then do that. Take a blog that I just wrote and then turn that into all these different pieces of content you can use everywhere. I think I'll repeat that one again in September. I've already set the August ones up, but I reckon September, we will look at that one again because I think there's a lot of value in that. When you take a blog like we just wrote 
and how we can turn that into 30 different pieces of content. So you're essentially doing one blog post, but you're getting tons and tons and tons of stuff on that. Um, there is a link to that webinar you can view. So it'll be called um, Turn Your Blog Into 30 Pieces of Content or into over 30 pieces of content. Um, it's at YouTube. So just go YouTube Business Station. And when you get the Business Station channel, they haven't got like a huge amount of those videos, but I know that one is there. And it was a really fun one. So if you wanna watch that, they'll give you an idea how we took a blog, just like what I did there, and turned it into tons and tons of different pieces of content. In fact, I think I took someone else's blog. I didn't even take one of my own. I went to a random website, pulled out a blog post, and then, okay, let's create some, some stuff around that. Then, if you break it all up for social media, like we did in that video, you're looking at graphics and video and short written pieces that carry it way beyond just the, the, the blog that you wrote. So that's syndication. So, but it raises the question, you know, doesn't all this duplicate content get punished by Google? And for a long time, that was absolutely true. Google was looking for fresh, unique content. Then a little something happened. We hit peak content. We hit like so much content around the world and a lot of it had gone to social media and there's a lot of sharing of social media stuff. So yes, at one stage, Google did used to punish that. Now they're not. What they do punish is when you've got the duplicate content on your own website. So that's where people create sort of link farms in their website where they create landing pages where every word is the same on that landing page, except that you've changed the word, the name of the town that it's geared towards. They know that that's not really writing anything of any value for that town. It's just going, I just want to appear in searches for Mount Isa, not just for, um, for Cairns. So no, it's not going to punish you if you've got the same blog posted in lots of different places. In fact, if you use those posting of places to point back to your original blog on your website, it actually can be really helpful for your backlinks to appear. Not all the platforms are going to give what you call a follow or an index when they're linking back to you, but some do. And regardless of whether they do, if anyone decides to click on there to see more of your stuff because they like the blog that you did, then you're getting another piece of traffic you otherwise wouldn't get. So some of the places to syndicate to include LinkedIn. Has anyone ever done a LinkedIn article? Did anyone even know you could do LinkedIn articles? Everybody who's got a LinkedIn presence can create an article on LinkedIn and then share that through LinkedIn as well. You can also share that article outside of LinkedIn. LinkedIn's really good at providing link backs to their platform from other places and providing you a link out to where you're going. So what you would do is the end of a LinkedIn article, you would include a link back to the original place where you posted. All I usually write down at the bottom is, this was originally published at, and then a link to where it was originally published at. Medium is another great place. It's like almost like an exact duplicate of LinkedIn's articles. I don't know who copy who, but they look very, very, very similar. Medium is like an online newspaper where people like yourself, myself, we can contribute to providing news and features and editorials to a very, very big audience that goes well beyond you know, what we normally would get. I didn't think I'd get much audience there and then I started posting stuff. At first I didn't, but as I posted more stuff, I got more audience. What I'm finding now is that people are happening upon content that I wrote two years ago and commenting on it and sharing it and reading it and then linking back through the link. I'm finding I'm getting these little links coming up in my Google Analytics saying this person came through from Medium and they're like, I wrote that article two years ago. I hope it's still relevant. Same thing goes for Tumblr. It's just a really quick little blogging platform that allows you to copy and paste your blog in there. It gives another place for your web, for your links to be and for your blog to be. Blogger is probably the original really simple blogging platform. What I would tend to use Blogger for, for someone who wants to gain some extra sort of authority on the web is to have just another place to store their blog. So their blog appears on their website. It appears in LinkedIn articles, maybe on Medium, and it's on a separate place called Blogger. It can be if your business name is called, I don't know, ifixphones.com. Well, then you can have ifixphones.blogspot.com. It becomes a second outlet for your website. And once upon a time as well, we used to think that was bad. We used to think, oh, everything has to be under this controlled branded environment where everything is in this one voice that comes out from one website. These days, we've got Facebook, we've got LinkedIn, we've got Pinterest, we've got you know, all these different platforms. Some people have got a WordPress website and then they back it up with a Google site as well. The idea is to be 
in as many places as you humanly can be in without it taking up too much of your time, but allowing yourself to go, I don't care where my traffic comes from. I don't care where my sales come from as long as they come. I don't care where you find out that I am a graphic designer, um, whether it's in my blog, whether it's at my LinkedIn account, whether it's through Tumblr, Medium, Facebook, or my website, I just want you to find me. And it's, it's turning that around from the web being this great mysterious place of control to a place where, well, I've got all these platforms. Why am I not using them? And it's usually because it feels like it's a lot of hard work. But when you think about it, I'm copying and pasting. I'm copying and pasting that blog into LinkedIn articles and publishing it. That's about two minutes. Another minute and a half to two minutes to do it in Medium. Another probably 30 seconds in Tumblr. It doesn't take long. Blogger, maybe another minute. Facebook, I'll come back to that one. That's an important one. You might send it off to a newspaper so you can do a media release upon what you just wrote. Why not just send them to them? You know, newspapers are desperate for news in their local area. If you can provide them some news, you're likely to get some coverage, whether your newspaper's now gone online, as so many of them have, or whether they still print an actual, you know, daily, weekly, or some kind of publication that's actually on paper. Down here, I've got Google My Business. If you're wondering what that little logo with the G in it was, Google My Business allows you to post quite a few number of characters. If you keep a really short blog, like the one I just did before for the molasses pumps, you can copy and paste that into your Google My Business posts. And that produces a blog that's indexable on Google because it's on Google that then can link back to the original source. So if you go, okay, I'm writing this about molasses pumps, you can have a link then that goes to your molasses pump service. Awesome. It allows you to go, this is going to link to that. This is going to link to that. Together, they're all going to link back to the one place where I want people to be, whether that's your LinkedIn page or your blogger blog, or maybe it is your website on that buy page where people can book in a service for their molasses pump or book in your physiotherapy services or book a discovery call for your web design business. Then we've got Google Sites are free websites you can build for yourself. They're not the best looking things in the world. They are not the easiest thing to do necessarily all the time, but what they do allow you to do is to create another place for Google to find out information about you. So this isn't the primary place that people are gonna go. It's never gonna be the number one place where people are gonna go. What it says is that here's another source of information about me and what I do that I approve of and I have control of, and I can use it to link back to the primary place where I wanna be the primary place I want people to find me. So entering a blog in here is essentially as easy as entering it into your Google My Business account. So it's, it's all like really, really simple stuff to do. Um, a great question from Sarah here asking, when you say they all lead back to your website, do you, where do you put the link back to your website? Yeah, you do. So what you would do in the case of, um, I won't stop sharing that, I've just got to get back out of it without closing everything down like I did before. Let's see, here we go. You should still be able to see all this. So we did our molasses pump thing. We did all that. Then what we would do is in amongst that article, we could then add on something such as um, this was originally published at. And then you could then go what the address is that were published at the HTTPS my molasses pumps. R us dot com. That's really terrible spelling, but I'm, it's late in the day. I can be excused for that. So you can either do that or the most clever way to do it is you want to try and tie it back to who you are. So for instance, in say this is the version that's going out to your LinkedIn. You could go, if that was yours, uh, let's get, let's get the straight from the horse's mouth, Ballard Industrial. So I can go that in within here. Um, just ask Ballard Industrial. And then link in the name of your brand through to the place where you want people to go. So you want to go to Ballard Industrial. That's great. Now Google prefers, and this was, a, and this was the, um, oh, you're only seeing me. Sorry, I'll just got to bring that up. This is the problem you get when you're trying to share screens. Uh, let's try this one, desktop two. Sorry, that, now you can see it. Okay, so if you, Google prefers it when you highlight and link in a brand name than a generic term. So if I also say generic term like molasses, 
and then use that to link through to say Ballard Industrial, that's not as valuable a link as the actual name of Ballard Industrial being linked through openly to Ballard Industrial's website. And the reason for that is because Google knows that a lot of trickery goes on. You can, you can go to something which is quite easily searched like electrical power and you can go, okay, I'm gonna link that back to Ballard Industrial. But unfortunately, the term electrical power has absolutely nothing to do with, um, with Ballard Industrial. But the words Ballard Industrial does have a strong, strong link through to it. Even molasses pumps, so you can go uh, pumping molasses, uh, let's go molasses pumps. So we can go that, that has a stronger connection through to what is on the Ballard Industrial website than say something which just says like require and linking that. So making sure you link the right things. Pref first preference is the link a brand, so your brand name. So link the name of your business back to your business website, as opposed to just linking random words back. It becomes a lot more of a, it becomes, when, when Google goes there and looks at that link and follows that link through to see where it is, if it finds no relationship between the word, I don't know, um, electrical power and your website, and look at that and go, that's a very low power link. They won't punish you, but they're not gonna benefit you when they find that this is a link to Ballard Industrial and it goes to the Ballard Industrial website, that is a valid link that actually has some value to it. So that's what they would do. And even in, in Google My Business, there's a link at the bottom. So for instance, I use, um, let's just go to Google My Business to have a quick look. Business dot, actually I've got to go to my other screen. I've got to share another screen again. Sorry, folks. Bring this one back. I use a lot of different logins for a lot of different stuff. Um, I'm assuming you can see my Google My Business account now. Just tell me if you can, Sarah. I know you'll tell me. <laughs> I think it's Sarah Speller I'm talking about, sorry. Um, so if you can see this list, if I go for something like the Business Crisis Center, when I want to post my next article to it, it allows me to, let's uh, go and copy and paste that article. And we copy and paste it in here. And your link then would be say, for instance, learn more. And in it goes. So I'm gonna try and actually you know, test out my theory to see if the length of that article, if I can find it, I didn't close it as well. Here we go, back to our article. So my um, silly, uh, top thing where um there we go let's grab all that i'm going to take all of that material and i'm going to paste it into my status so it said yep it said that's pretty good it's not telling me that it's going to it's too much i could post that entire thing and it's going to answer those questions as i want i can attach a photo to that if i want to as well that's um a COVID 19 update i don't want that i want what's new add a photo let's pick up a photo from somewhere see what i've got in here to play with, don't have anything. Let's go pick up a photo to insert in there. The post is in there, so it's automatically taken that across, pull it down so you can actually see it in there. So it's accepting that word length. And then I'm saying to learn more at the end. So I can get rid of that there and just have it go, learn more at Ballard Industrial. Oh, I published that, oh, let's preview it, see what it's roughly gonna look like. And I've got a little article going on. And if I learn more, it takes me out to Ballard Industrial, which is the place that I linked to. So you're starting to see how blogs can go a lot further than just simply going to one location. You can go to many, many locations all at once and you're not going to be punished for it. In fact, it's quite a benefit, especially posting into something like um, Google My Business because it is Google. It's giving them a direct data point that says, here's more information about this business. Lauren's asking is it helps to have photos with blog posts in terms of Google recognition and ranking. Google doesn't care if you've got photos or not. Um, it cares about whether, the, whether the, um, the, the, the content is useful and relevant to the person who's reading it. So having a blog post is more of an aesthetic thing. Um, some, an example of not necessarily needing a blog post, uh, a, a big photo, would be Neil Patel. He's one of the best SEO experts out there. Um, he has a great podcast I listen to almost every day. 
and most of his articles don't have a leading photo. They have photos scattered through it to explain a concept or to back up what he's talking about. But yeah, it doesn't necessarily um, have to look at um, like a, a key photo. Now for you to share that on Facebook, if you wanted to share and automatically come up with a good photo, that might be important to you. But remember, you can just put any old photo in there and share a link in Facebook and it won't make much of a difference. Not many people are really clicking on our links in our Facebook pages these days anyway. Um, other places to go into and to be aware of how you go into them is Reddit. Now Reddit's not just about copying and pasting your, uh, your blog post. What it is, is looking for people who are asking the questions about molasses pumps that you want to answer. So if you see, um, you know, a quick, you just go searching in Reddit or Quora is exactly the same. They're just basically forums that talk about all manner of things and that you're going to answer those, those questions based on the content in your article. So you can start with, if someone's saying in Reddit, let's say Cora, someone's actually asked a question and said, what kind of pump is good for pumping molasses for stock feed? Then you answer that with, we find that um, the ones we use from us, that, that particular brand, Cytex, um, are really good. And we find that it's also useful to make sure that they've got a heavy duty um, petrol pump as the electric pump doesn't seem to have quite the amount of juice that the petrol pump tends to. And then you can, link, and you can read more about it at, and here's my link to where you can read more about it. So that's an authoritative link. It's you providing a useful answer to someone. You're not spamming people. You're just going as part of your attempt to get your material more out there. You're looking for where people are already asking about you. Or if it's something a little bit more general, someone's saying, hey, does anybody know anything about um, molasses pumps? And you go, yeah, we've got a whole lot of information over here. Here's one of the blogs we recently wrote about molasses pumps and how they're used in Australia, link. And then you've got another link coming back to you that's showing that you are quite authoritative in that. So in terms of time, I wrote, what, a 12 minute, 10, 12 minute blog. I could copy that into LinkedIn. Once I've got my rhythm and I know what I'm doing, I've got all my tabs open. It'd take me about, yeah, about a minute to copy that into LinkedIn, about another minute to Medium, probably 30 to 60 seconds on Tumblr. Once you're getting through all these areas, you've got something which when you get your stuff, you get your, you get your pump going, when you've primed your pump and you, and you know you've done this a few times, you can start to not just produce syndicated material in a blog, you know, within an hour, you can do it almost within half an hour. You get it down to a really fine art that you know what your, what your, um, what your formula is. Remembering the formula was all about that. Ask a question, answer that question as soon as you can at the top of the, the top of the article and then explain in, you know, three points is good, but make them relevant. Don't sort of go too far and too deep. If you've only got one point to make, just make the one point. The important thing about creating a blog and getting it syndicated is that you do it regularly. It's like social media. Social media is no good if you did it in June last year and haven't done anything since. It's only good if you just keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. It's that regularity. Anyone who's ever managed a website knows that it's not the thing that you do once a year that counts. It's going in every week and checking that everything's up to date, going and checking your traffic coming through Google Analytics, um, going and you know, making sure that your plugins and your, and your extensions are all up to date and your themes and your templates are up to date. It's some those little things you've got to hit away at a little bit every day. Well, I said at the very beginning, I couldn't get my business to show for digital marketing in my marketing Google until I sat down and went, I'm going to make a concerted effort to do this. I'm going to make it so that I write a blog post every day for 90 days. And it was an effort. I tell you, it was, it was late last year and it was, it was epic, but I got that position. I got that ranking within the top three within 30 days. So I could have stopped then, but I really wanted to make sure I got it well and truly. So I kept going to see what I could do. And then I created more and more pages in my website that contained really solid, good information. I looked for what people were actually searching for, not just what I wanted to write about. Most of the things I care about as a digital marketer, nobody cares about. But the questions that they're asking is not, how do I do good digital marketing? They're asking really simple questions such as, um, how do I make my blog relevant to the people in my local area? Or how do I make, um, how, do I, how do I compete with a bigger store in SEO. So to answer those questions, I want to come up for those answers as well. 
Lauren's asking, once you achieve a top ranking, does it take less work to keep that ranking or do you need to keep up the daily blogging? Good question. Keep going, but you don't have to go quite at the same one, at the same pace. What you want to do is if someone's well, well ahead of you, it's usually because they've been around for a long time and they've done a lot of hard work on the way. What you need to do is do enough hard work to not just get up to them, but overtake them. But to stay ahead of them means you need to stay fairly consistent. That doesn't mean blogging every day. You can drop it back to once a week, but you've still got that ahead. You've still got action. Chances are they still haven't found a way to be able to write those blogs, to be able to write that content, to be able to produce that new stuff coming through. They don't even know that but I, by asking a question and answering it is essentially what a blog is in this day and age. So as long as you keep doing it and keep following that, that formula, you've got something that Google really enjoys because it likes how to's and likes to have questions answered and you're continually doing it and you're finding new things to do it with. There's always someone who asks you, you ask your customers, like go base it on your customers. They will tell you what they need, what they want. Even if you ask them, say, oh, how'd you find me? And say, oh, I just typed into Google, you know, how to, how to feed stock during a drought. And you came up with these molasses pumps. Oh, great. That's fantastic. Then you know that how to feed stock in a drought is something for you to double down on. Make sure you write some regular stuff about that. So yeah, it's, a, it's, it's not a magic formula, really. It just makes sense. It's the same way that you would have formed a, an essay when you're in primary school, when you're writing your first essays, or in high school when you're writing your first more complicated essays. It was just a question that was asked that you had to answer directly. Then you had to explain your answer. And then you'd have a conclusion, which was basically just answering the question all over again. I think um, the formula used to be um, answer the question, answer the question in more detail, and then answer the question again was what we used to be told in, um, in high school about how to do an essay. So we've written our blog. We've looked at what syndication is. We know that Google's not going to punish you for doing this stuff. Here's a bunch of places where you can send off your blogs to to get a little bit more traction out of them and a bit more you know, backlinks to help you get a better rank in Google. If you'd like some more tips on blogging, I'm more than happy to help you out. Just um, the best place to get me, honestly, and those who have linked to me there, thank you, is on LinkedIn. I tend to answer that a lot quicker because I spend more time on LinkedIn than I do on Facebook. Um, and email is one of those things where because it's so much longer, it takes me a while to get back to you. But LinkedIn is like quick, short, sharp questions and answers. And I'd love to know how you do with your blog. Or if you just want 10 quick topics to write about, you just tell me what your business is, what you do. I'll send you back that same day, 10 topics or 10 questions that I believe that people are asking. Cause it takes me no more than about 30 seconds to do the search and a couple of minutes to write it. So yeah, if you got, you want ideas, I think I did this for someone who was on this call once upon a time and said, here's a bunch of questions that people are asking about what you do. It'd be a great honor to do that. Just um, get in touch with me. LinkedIn is probably the best one or you can drop me an email. I'm not going to ignore you and be able to help you to answer those questions to get you on the road to having, I guess, a better position on Google, which is ultimately what we want to do because that helps you get more sales, more sales makes you smile more or at least buy prettier clothes so you can feel better. Thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. I appreciate you taking some time out of your day. Thank you for asking all the questions, Sarah and um, Lauren and Sarah Denham and Diane and all that. We really, really hope this sort of stuck. You'll see it in a couple of days on the, on the YouTube channel of Business Station. So remember to go there business station in YouTube and you can see this and many other ones as well. You have an amazing rest of your week. I know I will. See you later.